Hello everyone, we're back with the second part of Rickshaw Girl. So, we are going to pick up where we left off last time. You um, just completed chapter three with me, and we found out uh, that Nema's really frustrated with the fact that she can't be helpful to her dad because she is a woman, and in this area at the time, um, women were not allowed to work. So you can tell that she's really frustrated, and I'm wondering what's going to happen as we continue. Chapter 4. The wheels in Nama's mind were spinning wildly. She, start, she stared at Salim's clothes. He wore a short, long guy, a curta skirt, and a cap. A cap that was just big enough to hide a girl's coiled braid. She's getting another one of her ideas. Salim told his reflection in the rickshaw's tin panel. Nama, Nama, what are you thinking? What if I disguised myself as a boy? Nama asked. I could drive Father's rickshaw for an hour or two every day. He'd have a chance to rest and I could earn some money. Salim shook his head. People will recognize you. It might work at twilight, Nama said. You can't see faces clearly at that time of day. Nima, it won't work, I tell you. Your passengers will know you're a girl as soon as they hear your voice. I wouldn't have to say much. Besides, I can sound like a boy. Listen to this. Nima deepened her voice. Three taka for a ride to the market, place and back. Salim grinned. You sound more like a boy than I do, he said. But this might be a good time to remember some history, Nima. Like the time you wanted to walk all the way to the Dhaka Zoo, for example, even though it takes four hours to get there by train. We were only six years old. Father found us before it got dark. What about the time you almost drowned trying to catch fish with that new kind of net you invented? I really thought those knots wouldn't break, Nama said, shrugging. But they did. Anyway, you pulled me to shore in plenty of time. But this is different, Salim. I'm older now. I'll ask mother and father per per permission first. Even if they let you try wearing a disguise, which I'm sure they won't, somebody in the village will find out. They're, they'll start gossiping. You'll bring shame on your whole family, Nema, and you don't want to do that. I don't care, Nema said fiercely. It's more shameful that I can't help by earning a little money. Besides, mother and father can keep a secret. Even Rashida knows how to hold her tongue. I promise to stay away from the relatives' huts. Somebody switched off the radio and Selene climbed back on the cycle seat. There has to be another way for you to earn more some money, he told her. We'll think of something, Nema. There isn't another way, Nema said, folding her arms and jutting out, jutting out her chin. Salim sighed, shook his head, and drove away. Nama stuck out her tongue at his back. Easy for you to say, she thought, you're a boy. She turned back to the rickshaw, and in her imagination, she moved forward with her plan. First, she'd convince her parents. Father, you need rest. You can't get sick again. Mother, it's only an hour a day. Nobody will recognize me. What a wonderful idea, Nama, mother would say. You're so thoughtful. See, I told you a daughter is just as good as a son, father would add. I knew she could do it. But could she? She squinted at father's rickshaw, sparkling in the sunshine. After her cleaning, it was beautiful, but it looked so heavy. She'd never driven one before. She was about the same size as, as Salim, though, and he managed to turn the pedals. She'd just have to show father how good she was. Then he'd be sure to let her try it. Chapter 5. Nama glanced around. The village was silent, the lane empty. Quickly, she climbed up on the cycle seat. She had to stand to reach both pedals at the same time. Grasping the handles for the balance, she pressed hard with her feet. The rickshaw didn't budge. Nama pushed against the pedals with all her might. The rickshaw started rolling downhill. She was doing it. She was driving the rickshaw. As soon as she turned the pedals, Nema pictured Father's smile as she handed him the taka she had earned. In her mind's eye, Mother got teary as she unwrapped a silk sari that Nema had picked out. An imaginary Rashida giggled as she popped one rashagala 
after another in her mouth, devouring the whole pot that Nima had brought home from the sweet shop. Before she realized what was happening, the lane began to curve. At the bottom of the slope, a thicket of bushes loomed ahead. They were coming closer and closer. Desperately, Nima tried to turn the rickshaw, but she couldn't. Seemed to change directions. She squeezed the handbrakes as hard as she could, but the rickshaw seemed to pick up speed instead of slowing down. She couldn't steer it. She couldn't stop it. Just before the rickshaw careened into the bushes, Nima managed to jump off the cycle. She landed on her hands and knees in the dusty lane. Crash! The rickshaw just kept hurling through the thicket like a stampeding animal. Nema stayed where she was and listened to the rasp of thorns clawing the tin. Her heart was beating like a tabla drum. When everything was still, she stood up and made herself look. The thorns had captured Father's gleaming new rickshaw, bushes closing around it like a trap. Nima groaned and, groaned and turned away. Rashida was standing at the curb of the lane, her mouth as round as the Alpana circle. Nima gestured at her sister, combing the air with her palm down, and Rashida raced down the hill. The two sisters struggled to pull out the rickshaw, but it was too heavy for them. Get father, Nima said finally. She sat on the rock and waited her, waited her head in her hands. What had she done? Why hadn't she stopped to think? Mother was right. Nima was too thoughtless. Salim had been right, too. This had been another one of those silly ideas. Father and mother and Rashida came running. Mother gathered Nima close. Then she held her out at a harm's length, scanning her face, hands, body. Are you bleeding? She asked. I'm all right, mother, but... Nima's voice broke. Father was already in the bushes. Somehow he managed to wrestle the rickshaw back onto the lane. All four of them gasped when they saw the scratches on the leather and the dents on the tin. The peacock feathers on the side panels were torn and ragged. Even the painted lotus flowers on the back panel had been clawed by the thorns. Eesh, mother wailed. You've ruined the rickshaw, Nema. What were you thinking? I, I was trying to drive it. What? Why in the world would you do something like that? I'm sorry, Nima managed to say, fighting back tears. I was trying to see if I could drive it so, so that I could give Father a rest. It was too late to explain her whole idea. She knew they'd never let her try it now. The sun has been shining too hot on your head, daughter, Mother scolded. Have you ever seen a girl driving a rickshaw? I thought you were growing up, Nema, but you're as careless as ever. Father didn't say anything. His face was grim. He climbed on and pushed the pedals. The rickshaw moved slowly, like an ox obeying its master, even though it didn't want to. It still works, Father called over his shoulder, heading for the hut. Nema could hear the relief in his voice. She spanked the dust off her hands and clothes hard and trudged uphill slowly behind her mother and Rashida. Chapter 6 Father had parked the rickshaw in front of the hut. Nema kept her eyes down as she passed it. Inside, she went straight to her mat and pulled the sheet over her head. She felt the thump of her sister landing cross-legged beside her. A small hand fumbled under the sheet to find hers. We need to repair it soon, Mother was saying. With such a ruined rickshaw, you won't get any business for weddings or other parties. Both of the repair shops in our village are too expensive, Father said, and they don't do good work. Where will you take it? I heard a rumor that Hassan's rickshaw repair shop is opening up again in the next village. Old Hassan was the best rickshaw painter for miles around. The best work at the best prices, he used to brag. And he was right. One of his sons must have decided to start the business up again. I'll take the rickshaw there as soon as it opens. It's going to be expensive, Mother said. We'll have to get it painted again and fix the dents and tears. Let me, let me see how much money I'll need to make. Nima heard the rattling sound of, tin bank, of the tin bank they kept in the wardrobe. We can't use that money, Mother said. Mother said. That's for Rashida's school fees. Here, take this instead. We'll have to trade it in for repairs. 
Nama yanked the sheet off her head. It was just as she'd feared. Mother twisted off one of her two gold bangles she always wore on her wrist. She was holding it out to father. Nima saw father looking deep into mother's eyes. You were wearing these on our wedding day, he said. Mother smiled. What's mine is yours, remember? Father took the bangle and put it back on mother's wrist. Naima waited for him to declare that he'd never sell it. Instead, he said, we'll trade it only if I can't earn enough money. Naima couldn't believe it. That bangle had been given to her great-grandmother by her mother. The soft clinking of those two circles had always made music for their family. Now they might lose that music forever. She lay down and covered her face again with the sheet, wishing she didn't have to take it off. The tears were coming fast now. She heard the rustle of her sister getting up. She felt the weight of father's palm on her covered head, resting there for a moment. His footsteps crossed the stone threshold. The bell of the rickshaw chimed as he drove away. Someone gently pulled back the sheet. A soft hand smoothed the tangled hair off her forehead. A low voice began a familiar lullaby. Nama wiped her tears and drew a shaky breath. The pain inside her heart loosened a bit. The the pair of bangles was still singing on Mother's wrist. Maybe Father could earn the money for the repairs. Chapter 7 After the crash, Father no longer came home for lunch. He was trying to find passengers while other rickshaws sat idle. He stayed out until midnight in case somebody needed an emergency ride. But Mother had been right. People didn't like the look of such a battered and dented rickshaw. They didn't trust a driver who had let his rickshaw get into such a state. Every afternoon, Nama searched Father's face. The bangle was still on Mother's wrist. But for how long? How many days could he work from dawn until midnight without getting sick? A couple of aunts came to visit, sitting outside on the threshold with Mother. What's wrong with Nama? One of them asked. We heard she crashed your rickshaw. Why in the world was she driving it anyway? Mother bristled. Everybody makes mistakes. She was only trying to help. She's growing up, you know. Mother's mother came inside to make some tea, and I heard the voices outside became whispers that carried into the hut. Wrecking a rickshaw is growing up? Doesn't sound like she was trying to help. Something must be wrong with that girl. Salim rode by, ringing his bell loudly, the white handkerchief poking out of his pocket. He even took it out and pretended to blow his nose, trying to make sure Nama spotted the signal. But she didn't push back the window covering and wave. She didn't dash outside so they could exchange a few words, and she certainly didn't slip over to the banana grove to meet him. I'm already a disgrace, she thought. If my aunts catch me spending time with a boy, I'll bring even more shame to my mother. During the next couple of weeks, Salim made several more attempts before the handkerchief disappeared and he stopped ringing the rickshaw bell. Nama peeked at him from behind the curtain, fiddling with the white ribbon she kept hidden on her wrist and under the long sleeve of her salwar kameez. Life was closing in around her like the bushes had closed in around the rickshaw. She even wished that her parents would punish her for what she had done. But after scolding her that first day, Mother never brought it up again. She seemed to think Nama was feeling bad enough. Our daughter is so sad these days, she told Father one night when she thought the girls were asleep. She doesn't rush through her chores to paint alpanas. She doesn't chatter nonstop about crazy ideas and plans. She moves so slowly and keeps so quiet, I hardly know she's there. She'll be herself again soon, Father said, as soon as we get the rickshaw fixed. Father's confidence helped a little, but Nama still felt empty and numb. When she closed her eyes, the only thing she could picture was Father's beaten and bruised rickshaw. The image of it blocked the Alpana designs that used to dazzle her mind with color. She could hardly remember the countless ideas that used to spin in her mind as she washed clothes or chopped vegetables. International Mother Language Day, February 21st, came and went. Nama couldn't bring herself to decorate the family's hut, even though Rashida pleaded with her to try. Rashida and Mother did their best, but the prize went to a girl on the other side of the village. Relatives gathered at an a great uncle's house to eat barani chicken and celebrate the holiday. Nima's aunts wore new silk saris rustling like the wind in the rice paddies. Mother put on her party sari, the one she wore every year. 
Nima noticed the patch she was trying to hide, and how faded the Suri looked among the bright colors of the others. Any news about the repair shop in the next village? Father asked. I think it's opening next week, someone answered. Hassan's prices and work were always the best for miles around. The crooks who run the shops around here are spreading rumors about that shop already. What are they saying? Oh, I don't believe anything they say. They don't want to lose any, our business, so they make, they're making up all kinds of stories. They're probably telling the truth, an older uncle said. The old man tried to train his sons, but neither of them, neither one of them was good as good as he was. I'll let you know when I find out, father promised. After the holiday, the days slipped back into their pattern. Rashida was back at school. Father was working day and night. Mother and Nema were doing the household chores in silence. And Salim was riding by, stone-faced, keeping his eyes straight ahead as he stare, steered his father's workshop up and down the lane. So, we are going to stop there for today. I'm wondering what is going to happen next in this story. You'll be able to find out soon as we read more in the coming days.